God does not bring his children into boardrooms to battle. Grace and peace, everybody. Welcome to Sabbath School Study Group. My name is Chris Bailey, and we are in part number two of this five-part series. Today, we go from looking at Esther, how God now is showing how he can turn an exit and turn it into an entrance for his will through Esther. He's about to do the same thing through Mordecai, but we're going to see his faithfulness. But before I get started with Mordecai, I want to thank you for watching. We need more views. We need more people to know about these words. So please share this video with somebody else. Stay in touch by subscribing to the channel and hit the thumbs up, hit the like button. When you smash that, it's like letting somebody else know, I like this, you should too. When we look at the story of Mordecai, we see amazing lessons, amazing testimonies. As we are witnesses in this world, what can we learn from his story? Well, one thing we can see is that God does not call us up to bow down when we get there. See, when God calls us up, he's calling us up to stand up. Bow to him, but stand on what he has allowed us and, and even anointed us to do. See, in the story of Mordecai, he is the cousin of Esther. He is the one who's raised this orphan child as his own. And it turns out that while Esther eventually does become queen, Mordecai actually gets into the king's court. He, he's, he's not in the realm. He's not as close as he's going to be in the end of the story, but he's in the house. He's working in the palace. So, so Mordecai has been promoted, but notice his, his integrity in his promotion. So now that we got Mordecai, we see his role and his, his job, someone else gets promoted. It's a man by the name of Haman. He does not like Mordecai. Why? Let's find out. It says, after these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. This is where things get thick. Already we see the drama, and you would think the story would be over where Esther's promoted this girl from nothing to now she's the queen. And at that time, she's promoted to queen to one of the largest empires in the world and in history. And here comes her cousin. And her cousin's promoted too, but so is Haman. Sometimes with your advancement, we have to recognize that in the great controversy, the enemy is advancing too. As a countermeasure to what the enemy knows God can do through Mordecai, he promotes and advances Haman. And in his advancement, it would be easy to say, well, in order to get along, in order to keep getting on, I need to just do like everybody else. But that's what not, that's, that is not what Mordecai does. Mordecai makes the decision, I'm going to keep serving the Lord. If he wanted someone to lay down, God would have called Haman. If he needed somebody who was just whatever, who could get drunk, who was temperamental, who was emotional, he would have called on Ahasuerus. But he couldn't use them. He could use Mordecai because Mordecai would stand on him. So Mordecai starts to get some smoke from those around us, gets a little static, because the king's servants in verse three, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Important note to think and to understand in this crisis now that Mordecai finds himself, what allows him to stay level, what keeps him grounded, is that he was not thinking about offending the king. He was not even thinking about offending Haman. There's no record of them even having a conversation where Mordecai calls him out. He rebukes him for this commandment. He goes to the king and calls him out for a law he should not have passed or this, this mini rule he shouldn't have passed. He never does that. Mordecai was not thinking about how can I transgress the law? Mordecai was focused on no matter what, I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I owe this to the one who has anointed me to be here. And so that's what allows him to stay focused in the midst of all of the fodder and all of all of the static that he was hearing around him. I'm not here to disrespect anybody, but I am here to be devoted to my God. Now that Haman has made his decision, Mordecai makes his decision. Because it comes to pass that when they spake daily unto him, when Mordecai's co-worker spoke to him, he hearkened not unto them. That they then tell Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told him that he was a Jew. 
When Haman saw that Mordecai vowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. In standing, we do not stand alone, but that goes both ways. There are other people who are going to see that stand. And beyond Haman and, and what, what he now proposes to do, because of his issues, these issues do not go unseen within the court, within the palace, by those around us. Mordecai is showing us that when we stand and we stand alone, it's not that God is trying to cause us to suffer. It's not that God is trying to cause us to, to go through something and some kind of, of, of joy at your struggle. Standing alone happens when you have been raised up. When Jesus says, if we would humble ourselves, that God would lift us up. When God lifts us up for his sake, the height to which he lifts us is necessary for other people to see his will. Through your example, when God raises us up, it's not to be better than others. It's so that others can see the way up, the way out. Here is where God uses Mordecai and it's how he wants to use us. Don't be afraid to be alone because Mordecai was not alone. And I'm not talking about Esther. He was not alone because he was standing on the promises of God. And when we pray for God to give us integrity, watch the story get real good because we make a decision to stay in God's decision. Thank you.